Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. I'm Josette Dubois, the program librarian for the Slover Library. And we are here tonight to talk about the art project that Kim McCoy has done called Hear Their Voices. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kim first and then we'll hear from some folks from Samaritan House. So Kim, if you're ready, let's go ahead and get started. Wonderful, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. If everyone could mute their um, audio, that would be fantastic. And then I believe that if anyone has any questions, please type them in the chat box and then Josette will be um, fielding those and we'll have some question and answer at the end of my segment. And then we'll invite Katie and Bobby from the Samaritan House to talk directly about the issue of human trafficking and their good work that they're putting out to make sure that we are, um, we're doing all that we can as a community and that they are as an organization. So thank you so much to the Slover Library for hosting Hear Their Voices and this um, this artist talk this evening. Um, I am an artist from Colorado originally and now I live in Virginia Beach and I work in a local nonprofit organization um, and in the arts and it's been wonderful living in Hampton Roads. And something that I've grown to be greatly aware of is human tra trafficking, especially in our area. A lot of people are, a lot of people are trafficked through our area. And, but my piece here is to talk about the art. So <laughs> I will go towards that air and um, follow along with me on my presentation. So here we are, this is, this is the day that I completed the original iteration of Hear Their Voices. And this piece was, came, was born out of a prompt from a class that I took in ODU. And my professor, Melissa Hill, um, charged us students with making a social activism assemblage where you're bringing things together that exist in the world in a different way, but then we are presenting them so they say something else. And so she also made us provide five distinct ideas for each project, which really helped expand my horizon of the of idea, uh, idea and creating. And so this ended up being the sixth idea that I had because I wanted to do something near and dear. And the morning after I turned in my assignment of my of what I'd wanted to do, this came to me and I saw it so clearly. I, um, I had a distinct vision of what I wanted to create, and this is what that vision was. This was my idea concept that I had turned into my professor, and I had called it the prayer box as a working name. I wanted to represent victims of human trafficking. I am not a victim of human trafficking, but the issue of human trafficking and slavery and all of the things that um, encompass people being treated as animals, commodity, all of the things has always really gotten into my, um, I don't know, it's really bothered me so deeply. And so this idea came through to create a environment that held undergarments um, that would represent each, would represent a victim. And I wanted them to be hanging by what would be their captors in a box. And I wanted it to be locked and with like a big padlock. So it was like there was this sense of, of captivity and of being held. But I also knew that I didn't want the piece to only be about that because I feel that there's always hope and I have hope for for the victims, all victims of human trafficking and misdoings, um, that maybe we can all be free. And so that piece that I had at the front, that was the back of the box where I really wanted to have prayers. Hey, Webb has joined the meeting. <laughs> I really wanted to have prayers represented. So we're holding hope that things might change. So I spoke with my mom and dad, they're both artists. My dad is a woodworker and my mom is a fantastic painter. And I said, so dad, I wanna make this box. And he kind of laughed lovingly, of course. And he said, Kim, you don't have the tools to make that box. He said, let me go ahead and make this for you. And I said, dad, it's due in two weeks. And he said, 
I'll get it done. He was in Colorado and he worked tirelessly to get me the box made. Mom and dad wrapped it all up and sent it to me like an Ikea package. <laughs> so these were the, the plans that I provided him as my concept. And at this point, when I was um, conceptualizing the project, a great question was asked, why not just use a chicken coop if you want to use chicken wire? And it really helped me define this piece that I did not want these people, these victims, to be seen as animals because we are not animals. This piece needed to be marked with a sense of dignity. It needed class. They needed to be held in a container that was worthy of a human. So although the piece is lined with chicken wire, which I felt was important because even though we are all worthy and we all, because of our God-given right as human beings, we are sometimes treated as otherwise. And so that's where that, that kind of juxtaposition of the chicken wire and then this fine carved box came through. So they sent me the box and um, my dad and I were over Zoom for like six hours on a Sunday. He helped watch me install every single screw into the box to get this thing constructed. It was pretty awesome. He was very patient. And then I went to the task of undergarments. I learned quickly that you cannot find donated undergarments, sometimes bras, sometimes men's, but never ladies, never children's. I wanted to be sure that men, children, and women were all represented because each are victims and each of us easily could be victims. If we caught ourselves at the wrong place at the wrong time, you never know what any of us could get in towards. So at this point, I wanted to bring in community. It felt important. So here there are pieces that I gathered from purchasing at stores, but then also donations that I received. Emily from, I received- Has joined the meeting donations from friends my boyfriend i put in a piece of my own articles because i wanted i wanted to be representing all shapes and sizes and when i went to do the shopping for the articles that were not donated it became almost a spiritual experience it was very tender because especially with the children's pieces i was envisioning a victim knowing full well that there are many out there and i just wanted to give a voice i wanted to hold space for these for these people so there were more than 80 undergarments in the piece and i dyed them all with an acrylic wash and so they became this the acrylic wash was a combination of blue it was ultramarine blue and burnt sienna paints to create a chromatic gray scale so each of the pieces was dyed at least one, if not three or four times to take the dye. And each of them, as you can see, they were hardened. And so I hung them as they dried. So they were like hardened um, in that what would be their hanging position. So when they sway in the wind, they don't make any noise and they don't move. On the right hand side, we see the elements of the captors. And there are some a bit more Hollywood, possibly, captor pieces where we have um, duct tape. I used chain link. I used electrical cord to represent the online trafficking industry, specifically with sexual trafficking. Then we have zip ties. And to me, zip ties really represent more of possibly the labor trafficking and stuff like that. Um, and then I was speaking with Bobby Hall of the Samaritan House who is with us tonight. And um, in our conversation, he helped transform the program or what I was offering because he was telling me that more victims than not are actually held captive by their identities. So their captors will take their passports, take their birth certificates and hold them as hostage. And so I created these, piece, these pieces that look like they're dyed, but I put a, a veneer kind of over them through a PowerPoint, and then I cut them up and turned them into paper chains. So through that, I was able to represent 
the um, the captors that are holding their victims hostage by their identities. So once I had all of the pieces together, um, put the box together and stained it, I began the installation and I started with the largest pieces, mostly the men's underwear, and then I worked inwards from there. So each piece has its own space within, but they're all off of the ground. So there is this sense of them hanging and they're, they're trapped. So then on the back of the piece, if you have seen it in person, and if not, here's a representation of the prayers. A friend actually gave me the Buddhist prayer flags, and I thought they were such a beautiful addition for the piece. And then I included a lot of my own sacred objects. I've been a seeker of the divine, and so I wanted to bring different elements from different religions into the piece to be Hopefully, if anyone who is a victim of human trafficking or a survivor of human trafficking ever saw this piece, I wanted them to know that there's someone here who is praying for them. Because I really am, and I feel like they're, if, if they could just see this and possibly be affected by that, maybe it could give them some renewed hope. So here's the piece finished on the first day. And this was the, these are the pieces, there are the pictures that I turned in with my assignment. I had two weeks from beginning to completion to make the piece. Here it is on the beach, in Virginia Beach. So then uh, we decided to drive it into Norfolk, into the Slover, for, I was so excited for this initial inaugural exhibition of the piece. So thrilled for the piece to be taken on. And once we had it all secured very well in the truck, we got on the road. And once we were on the highway, the unthinkable happened. The piece flew out of the back of the truck and it actually landed safely on the side of the road. By the time we got back to the piece, someone with their car had smashed it to smithereens. I was so upset. At first, I just couldn't even believe it. I just, I was just blown away and just crying. And, um, and then I looked at all of it and I thought, this is an assemblage. This, these pieces existed in the world. This piece can come back together. And so then I quickly spoke with my father who lovingly offered to help make me a second box. And then we went there. But before I move off of this slide, I felt for the first time, possibly, a little inkling of what someone who might be a victim of human trafficking could feel. I've heard so many stories where they get out of the industry and then they're sucked right back in through some strange way. They get back into it. So it's like they're rising up, everything is going towards the exhibit and then it's blown off to the side of the road. And I thought to myself, this cannot be the end. This piece, this conversation needs to happen. And I became more determined than ever through the heartbreak of losing the initial piece to make sure that we could actually see this piece, this hear their voices. So here's a picture. I had the great opportunity to go to Colorado for Christmas and be with my family. And in our free time, this is what my dad and I did. We went and bought the new lumber and you can see the piece here in the center of the room. We reconstructed the box and then I deconstructed the box, drove it back to Virginia. But I was so thrilled to have the opportunity to work with my dad's chisels. And for the new iteration of the piece, I made a plaque as I had at the beginning of the, of, of the show here, may all be free. So this is the piece when it was under construction. So back in Virginia, put the new piece back together. And I wanted to share that this was the only panel of the original piece that was not destroyed in the car accident. Nothing fell off. All of the prayers survived. Yes, there are some holes in the prayer flags, but everything made it quite a blessing. And here we made it back to 
its intended destination finally a month later, back to the Slover Library. And here I refined the design, I pull, I tightened up the design a little bit, and I added more black beads as hanging elements because I really wanted to also represent the, um, the issue of the high net worth trafficking industry and i had done that in the original piece with a couple of necklaces but i really wanted to represent that more and so i was able to bring in those new elements which felt also like a blessing so i was thrilled once the piece came on that um madison pierman of wavy 10 she's a story writer and she contacted the slower who contacted me and um, they presented on wavy um a nice story a great story about human trafficking with resources and she took some great photos and so i wanted to just share some of those photos with you now so you could see the piece kind of through her eyes So in closing this initial part of the presentation, and I'd like to open it up for questions, I wanted to share my vision for, for this project. I hope that this is the first iteration of the, of the Hear Their Voices piece. I would love for this to be a model because I envision this piece getting on a larger scale in public areas where community members could donate clean undergarments, they could donate prayer pieces, we can make large scale installations in cities all over to really expand the conversation of human trafficking. And I feel like this would be a wonderful opportunity for us to continue having the conversation so people can become more aware. And with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to see if we have any questions from the group. Thank All right. You. Wonderful. Thank you for that presentation, Kim. Yes, if anyone has any questions, please type them in the chat box and I will read them out for Kim to answer. I do want to add that I love that we were able to have a, uh, a poster board talking about the, uh, the accident that the piece had and how it was reborn. That kind of, I think, added a lot to the, the presentation and to the story. So while it was unfortunate that that accident occurred, it, I think it has enriched our final product. Yes, thank you. I agree. It's, it's pretty amazing that the piece has taken on a life of its own already. And um, if there are no questions, I will share that I um, had put together a fundraiser with working with Bobby. That a um, so Bobby and I had connected from the Samaritan House, and he helped me put together a fundraiser, which is still active for um, for the victims of human trafficking and for their human trafficking unit. And so I'd like to take this opportunity and we can also have more questions. If anybody thinks of anything towards the end, we can open it up for general questions um, after Bobby and Katie speak. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, Katie Cooper, who is the anti-trafficking supervisor for the Samaritan House, and also Bobby Hall, who is the development manager at the Samaritan House, for them to share about the topic of human trafficking and what's really happening out here. Great. Well, thank you, Kim, so much. Kate, I'm just going to jump in real quick, Katie. Um, I want to thank Kim for reaching out to Samaritan House to talk about this project. Um, I believe uh, a friend, a mutual friend, Pat, Pat Perry, had recommended she reach out to us to, to get this scope going and start the conversation around human trafficking, which is something that um, 
really needs to happen. More people need to be educated on human trafficking, need to be educated on labor trafficking, sex trafficking, um, domestic servitude, the differences in those and what to look out for. So we really appreciate when people come to us and try to engage the community in this dialogue. Um, Samaritan House, so you all know, we've been around for over 30 years. We are an organization that helps victims of domestic violence, human trafficking, sexual assault, and family homelessness um, in Hampton Roads with a holistic approach. So we provide emergency shelter, first, first and foremost, to get people out of a dangerous situation. And then we provide comprehensive services like case management, victim advocacy, um, counseling, um, our, our, my, our colleagues, or my colleagues in the program department, they do some wonderful work connecting victims straight to medical care if they need it, dental care, um, child care. They, do, they really make sure that a victim comes through our services and then has a brighter future set forward for them. Um, so, so that's a very brief explanation of our programs, but I'd love to have Katie jump in if you want to, Katie, now and kind of just talk about our work and the task force we've been a part of for the past three years. Yes, thanks. So, Samaritan House is a victim service provider for the Hampton Roads Human Trafficking Task Force. Um, so we're working with Homeland Security, FBI, law enforcement, uh, as well as all different community programs, all to identify, support, and provide services to survivors of human trafficking, both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Um, so we, Samaritan House is in Virginia Beach, but like I said, we serve all of Hampton Roads, uh, even the Eastern Shore, up, um, we're stretching out to Gloucester, Williamsburg, so we're expanding and trying to help as many people as we can. We have a specific shelter and program just for survivors of human trafficking as part of Samaritan House. We have 12 beds specifically for these survivors. Um, in shelter, we do case management, like Bobby was saying trauma-focused services. Uh, we offer art therapy, yoga, equine therapy, counseling. So looking at trying to a holistic approach to um, assisting our survivors. Um, we, like I said, we work with the task force. So we work hand in hand with law enforcement. So if they identify victims, they can bring them to us and we will jump right in there and just do wraparound services and try to help them on their path towards healing. I wanted to discuss some red flags, um, kind of give you guys ideas of what to maybe look for or what, if you see something, what might be human trafficking and then some ideas of what to do about it or what to do to start conversations in the community. So some red flags that you may want to look out for or see for human trafficking, both sex trafficking and labor, uh, someone working with little or no pay or no access to their earnings. So maybe they're working, but someone is controlling that money and just doling out a little bit at a time or none at all. Uh, they may have very few personal possessions and they may not know exactly where they're at. Sometimes traffickers move them around a lot, so they're disoriented, they're not quite sure exactly where they are, and that's a form of control. They may have an inconsistent story about where they're from or why they're there. They might say, I'm, I'm just here visiting, but they're not quite sure where they are. You might have multiple people with multiple different conflicting stories. They're not in control of their identity docs. So their ID, their birth certificate. I think that was great when Kim has in the box the identity um, documents as part of the chain because that is a form of control that we do see. Clients coming in, they don't have an ID, they don't have their birth certificates, they don't have a passport. And these are basic things that we need to do basic, basically anything, right? To get a job, anything, you need an ID, you need a social security card. They don't have control of these things. If they are for national, they may be threatened of, if you talk or you say anything, I'm gonna report you, you're gonna get deported. So those passports are also controlled. You may see signs of physical abuse, lack of health care. Um, for youth, you might see them having really expensive items. They have expensive clothing out of nowhere, expensive jewelry, a really expensive phone. These are signs that sometimes are being groomed that maybe a trafficker is starting to lure them in. Um, they might refer to a, a boyfriend who's older as uh, daddy. Um, they might also be a chronic runaway. Those are signs. 
Also branding, certain tattoos and branding can also be a red flag. So if you see these things, there is a national human trafficking hotline. You can call to report tips or concerns. That number is 1-888-373-7888. So they will take tips, they will see how they can assist. Uh, and we don't ever suggest that you approach a victim of human trafficking. We don't know where the trafficker is and it can be quite dangerous, but you can always call the hotline and say, I saw something concerning. Um, I'm, you might wanna check into it. Virginia was recently ranked 15th in the U.S. for reported cases of human trafficking. So it is something that is happening here. Um, we have the interstate here, we have military, we have the tourist aspect, a lot of people moving in and out. So it is a hub, unfortunately. Uh, the average age for human trafficking in the U.S. is 13. And most people who are survivors of human trafficking are US citizens. So a lot of times I think we think of people are trafficked from other countries, which does happen, but the large majority of these victims are US citizens. And a lot of them that we're seeing in our program are from Virginia. So if, like I said, you can call the hotline for tips, you can call Samaritan House and connect someone to us for services, for resources, we also serve people in the community. So if you know someone who is a victim of human trafficking and they don't need shelter, but they need services, we're happy to help them as well. Uh, our hotline is 757-430-2120. We also have an amazing staff that will come out and do education and outreach, and they'll come to your church, they'll come to your group, and talk about human trafficking and just educate and share resources. So we would love to do that. If you have um, a group that you think you would like us to come out and share more and talk more and give more information, call us. We would love to come out and raise awareness and tell you how you can raise awareness in your community and share the information so that we can help these survivors thrive and continue. Does anyone have any questions? And while those, yeah. questions, while those questions are through, whoa, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, um, I wanted to share that when I was doing my research for the project that um, I couldn't find a determining that number of victims of human trafficking their numbers really range between 25 million and 41 million victims worldwide. And nobody knows how many people because it's untraceable. Okay. It's under the radar. Nobody really knows. So that's that's part of the gravity of this situation. Um, so just wanted to mention that important piece. And that's a great point, Kim. Um, I wasn't here at this when we started the human trafficking program. I wasn't with Samaritan House at the time, but um, when we first started the program about three years ago, I believe we expected about 10 to 12 clients that first year, maybe 15. We ended up with over 110. Or is that right, Katie? Is that number right? Sorry. <laughs> over 110. So we really learned quickly in that first year that we were just brushing the top of the iceberg um, when it comes to human trafficking just here in our region, let alone across the entire nation or internationally. So Kim's point is definitely exact. Um, and also to Katie's last point, uh, that this happens in our backyard, it can happen to individuals, not just groups, it can happen to kids. Um, two cases during the COVID timeframe between April and September that we, that the Human Trafficking Task Force saw were cases in which parents um, trafficked their children. Um, so just give you an idea that trafficking can come from all sorts of places. It can come from someone starting to act um, as a boyfriend and giving you giving a victim presence and making them feel special. And then that slowly transforms into um, something like sex trafficking or labor trafficking or what have you. So it, I just wanted to add those points in there as well. Um, but if, if anyone has questions now, um, we can take those. 
And I can add too that we have seen uh, an increased referral of labor trafficking. I think labor trafficking is something that people don't talk a lot about, but it's something we're starting to see more and more of uh, people being, especially homeless people being targeted or low income who are just trying to find a job, especially if we have COVID right now, People, a lot of people are out of work and desperate for some kind of employment and they're being promised you're going to make Twenty dollars an hour. You can do this. We're gonna. You have a place to stay here, and they get there, and their wages are being taken, withheld, poor living conditions. So that is something that we are seeing more and more of at Samaritan House, as well as being reported, and it's coming to light as well as the sex trafficking that's happening. Yeah, and we're seeing that across the board. So we're seeing the same type of increase in domestic violence um, and demand for services there as well because of COVID. To all the points Katie um, already stated, you know, just being stuck at home, people maybe drinking more, people getting frustrated, people losing their jobs. A lot of things can escalate in a situation. That's so sad. Um, the question that Lewis has asked, how much longer will the peace be at Slover? Great question. Um, the peace will be at Slover through the end of this month. And I believe the Slover is closed on Mondays. So, but during open hours, you're welcome to go see the peace. And they also have a nice exhibit right now on um, um, uh, African American Awareness Month and all of that, so so that's exciting. And um, I, I hope if you haven't seen the piece, then you'll have the opportunity to see it in person, spend some time with it. Yes, we are closed Sundays and Mondays. We are um, open Tuesday through Friday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. and Saturday from noon to five. Great. Any other questions, comments, anecdotes for everybody who's been with us tonight? Um. I see that um, Soham Patel has a nice question. Um, I'll go ahead and read it. It says, hello, I'm an honors student at East Carolina University. My honors group is working to instill a bill in North Carolina to require middle school students to be taught about the dangers of human trafficking. Fantastic. We have gotten into contact with multiple North Carolina House representatives. So my question is, do you guys know of any ways to help gain traction or support behind a human trafficking bill? It's a great question. Um, I'll jump in on that one, I guess. I'm not as familiar with how you go about getting a bill passed. You know, we work with the regional task force. We work with lawyers. We advocate with our community partners um, and with government agencies to uh, tackle all of these ops, all of these things that we face. Um, unfortunately, I don't know exactly how you can go about getting more exposure for your your awesome bill. But I would say it's all about marketing and outreach to just continue hitting the pavement and making those phone calls. Um, when I worked in the Senate, that's really what you had to do is just keep making those calls to community leaders, keep making those calls to congressmen um, and you know get yourself as much publicity as you can for that cause. I hope that helps. Uh, it looks like someone else, Cindy has a question. I do, and I'm sorry I didn't know how to use the chat box, but I wondered if Katie would mind to repeat the hotline phone number. I wrote quickly, but I didn't catch it all. Absolutely. I'll repeat it, and then I'll put it in the chat box as well for everyone. Uh, Samaritan House's hotline is 757-430-2120. And the National Human Trafficking Hotline number is 1-888-373-7888. And I'll put that in the chat box as well as for everyone. Thank you. You're so welcome. Great. Did anybody else have any questions? Um, I also wanted to mention, I know some folks came in later to the... Um, to the talk this evening. I know that Josette is going to be um, putting it on the website. Josette, could you maybe tell us a little bit about where you're going to be putting the recording of the video once it's done? 
Absolutely. So we have our website, sloverlibrary.com, where this video and other videos of previous programs that we have recorded are housed. You will also be able to see a calendar of programs that we have upcoming. We've got some really exciting things on the horizon for the rest of winter and going into springtime. So that's sloverlibrary.com, and I'll put that in the chat. That's great. And um, if anyone would like to keep in touch, um, my contact information for for this work is I'm on Instagram at Kim McCoy Art, and then also um, my my Gmail address is Kim McCoy Art at Gmail .com. So, if anyone has any um, indicators of places that we could host the piece, I would definitely love to have the piece displayed in other locations just to keep this conversation going or um, any ideas of where we could possibly put the piece. It's really about the message and making sure that human trafficking doesn't disappear from our minds. Um, I feel like it's important and I was actually really touched. Um, somebody had seen the um, Wavy 10 piece that they had done on um, on the work and and she was actually a victim or a survivor of human trafficking and it had inspired her. And so that was my goal with the piece was if I could just inspire one person who had been a victim and, um, and that has happened. So I'm grateful for that. And now I feel like it's time to take it to the next level and get this piece out there. And it's, it's all about the work and it's all about, about giving people voices that really need one. That's that's a wonderful sentiment, Kim. Um, anyone else have anything that they'd like to ask or add? If not, we can end this a little bit early and uh, have a have a good evening. So it's uh, a couple more minutes in case anyone has anything they want to add. Yeah, um, I just want to say apologize. I came in. Uh, of course, I had another meeting right before this one. But I just want to say first of all, Kim, thank you so much for creating the piece. I wish I I want to hear more about it. Um, and then I also like to. Uh, connect with everyone um, just to find out more about um, your passion for fighting trafficking and how you specifically go about that. Um, I'm an attorney uh, as well as a member of a, a nonprofit that fights trafficking in the area called Um So I just wanted to just kind of put that out there more, not as an advertisement, but really I just want to see each of you because it looks like all of you are at least knowledgeable and actively involved about trafficking. So just wanted to connect. So thank you so much again, Kim, and thank you so much for, for hosting it, uh, Gisette. You're yeah. very welcome. I think it's fantastic. I think it'd be wonderful to connect and, um, and let's make it happen. Absolutely. I'm going to put my contact information in the, um, in the chat here, just in case, um, if you'd like to get in contact, Josu, it's nice to meet you. Um, real quick before we wrap up as well, I put my email address in the chat if anyone's interested in the education that um, Katie had mentioned, you know, whether it be your church or if you have a child in school, we have primary prevention specialists as well that educates in schools. Um, please feel free to reach out to us if you want to tour our facility, reach out to me as well. Um, we have groups like Women Against Violence that advocate and volunteer on a regular basis. So there's a lot of ways to get involved and just reach out if you are interested. All right. Um, I think that concludes this evening's program. Thank you so much to everyone who presented and for everyone who was here tonight to listen to this story and to try to, you know, help uh, eradicate human trafficking, you know. So thank you so much for everyone and have a great night. Thank you all so much. Thank you for spending your time with us. Thanks, Kim. Thank you.